Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game Cause the journey's where you are Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. And failure's never final when the father's in the room.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for joining us this morning as we continue the series on Choosing Hope. I hope that your Easter celebration last Sunday was a great one because ours was great. We all encounter challenging and difficult situation in life, losing a loved one, losing a job, going through a breakup. Most of the time we are able to understand that even when we experience challenges like that, things will get better. But sometimes we may feel like we'll never, be, we'll never feel better, that we are powerless, that our situation is never going to change and never going to improve. Now that is hopelessness. Losing someone you love dearly, losing your health, your ability to physically function, losing your source of income can lead to feelings of hopelessness. Experiencing financial hardship, poverty, housing instability, and other financial struggles. Losing a job, being demoted, or being denied a promotion, a job opportunity, failing a class, or consistently just struggling in school. Feeling isolated from friends and family, trying to work out a relationship that is not going anywhere, having difficulty connecting emotionally with others, or experiencing rejection repeatedly, living with a chronic illness, or chronic pain, receiving a medical diagnosis for a terminal, a terminal or progressive illness in your life, feeling trapped in an abusive relationship. Now, it's common for someone dealing with loss or instability to feel sad and lonely or like a failure and to not have emotional energy or the tools to improve their situation. Now, if someone is dealing with more than one of this situation at the same time or repeatedly struggling with the same experiences, feeling of hopelessness becomes reinforced. Feeling of hopelessness begins to set in in our lives because it may be difficult to believe that things are even going to get better. This can actually lead to feelings of maybe I'm not being good enough, I'm just not good enough, or maybe there's no point of even trying. Now, the last two years of life has been tough for every one of us in the world. Before the pandemic hit, life was already tough for many people. And then the pandemic hit, hits us. And to this moment, especially for many people whose lives had been directly affected by, by this virus, you still feel the pain and the grief of the effect of the pandemic. Now, I think we could all agree that life is tough. It's just tough. As I sit with people on Zoom or just face-to-face -face Zoom with people and hear their stories of what they've gone through, through during the pandemic, they, see, they say things like, my situation has gone worse. I'll never get better. I have no future. No one can help me, Pastor. I feel like giving up at this point in my life. I think it's too late now. I'll never, I'll never recover from what had happened. Sometimes things hit you all at once and you begin to despair. <clears throat> I call those moments, I call it like getting, hit, getting the hope kicked out of you. And I think we all felt that at some point in our life. Some of you, if the truth be known at this moment, feel pretty hopeless this morning. Maybe you feel hopeless about a marriage situation and you think it's just not getting any better. Maybe you feel hopeless that you're never going to get married. Some of you feel hopeless. Maybe you, you think you're never going to get a child. Some of you parents feel hopeless about your child's, uh, your child who has special need. You feel hopeless about the financial situation. Maybe about an illness that you're battling right now or someone in your family. Maybe you feel hopeless that you're in a situation that's just never, ever going to get, to, never going to change. Now, I'd like to say this. Hope is one of those critical values in life that is slowly dissipating in our times. 
Someone said it is one of the lowest, lost values in our world today. One of the main reasons is the fact that we are just bombarded every second with bad news, dreadful and frightful news. The second reason probably is because of the corruption. Studies have shown that dishonesty and exploitation we see in those who are called to lead us and protect us is causing people to lose a lot of trust and hope. The loss of trust in the integrity of many of the experts in all the fields, in the sciences, in education, in politics, technology, and even in religion, right? Has caused so many people to become skeptical and sometimes cynical and come to, uh, coming to the, the conclusion that we're all doomed and that just, we just have no hope. The question now is this, how do we store hope? How do we restore hope back into our lives today? How do we raise children to live a life of hope no matter what's ahead of them? How do we encourage our youth and our young adult to thrive in life with a spirit of unrelenting hope? Now, honestly, I want to share this message for two reasons this morning. One, is for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. I think we need to be reminded what a good deal Jesus Christ has given us for free. Now, the problem is sometimes after we become a Christian for a while, we start to forget. Basically, we start to really forget how good salvation is for us. We've taken for granted the blessings and, and, the, and the benefits that come with, from our salvation through Jesus Christ. We kind of forget about the good deal that we really got. Now, second is this. For those of you who are seekers and those of you who are admirers of Jesus, I'd like for you to hear what Jesus offers you. And I'd like to say this, it is an offer no other person in this world really can give you. And it's something I would, I would really like you to consider at this moment. Jesus said it himself in John 10, 10. He said the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. <clears throat> then he said this, my purpose is is to give them rich and satisfying life. In another translation, he said this, I have come that they may have life and life and have it full, life in its fullness. Now, some people takes that verse, interprets that passage as a life without problems, a life of financial prosperity. Now, can I say this? The truth is this, even godly people have problems. Christians have problems. Christians suffer from financial poverty. So this morning, we're going to look at the life that Jesus offers us. What does this life, what does this look like? <clears throat> I'd like for us to look at the life that Jesus offers us so that we can live a life of hope. Now take notice in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul tells us the reason for hope. He said this, in the past, you were without Christ and you have no part in the promises God made to his people. You had no hope. You didn't know God. Now no, notice this next phrase. He said, but now you are in Christ. Ephesians tells us that the reason we as Christians have hoped and to restore hope in our lives is because Christ is in us. Now, it's not religion. It's not how good you are. It is because Christ is in us. And if we put our trust in Christ, Ephesians says, we can live a life of hope. Now in Christ, I, you and I can always be hopeful because Christ has given us a life without condemnation. His pardon erases all our guilt. Now let's look at the first one in Romans, Romans 8. Now Romans 8 is a very rich chapter and we're going to go through it real quick right now. Now it says in Romans 8, 1, it says, There is no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now notice that no condemnation. What does it mean? That means I can live guilt-free without condemnation. Did you know that the number one cause of hopelessness is hidden guilt and hidden shame? We violate God's standard, much less ours. And then we think, oh my gosh, I could never be forgiven for what I've done. I'm going to carry this for the rest of my life. And that's why I'd like to say this, there is no perfect crime. 
because you, you and I cannot run away from our conscience. It is always with us. I always say this, you can hide it from everybody. You did a crime and you can hide it from everybody, but you can never hide it from your conscience. Whenever you and I violate our conscience, it figures out a way of getting even. It causes us to withdraw. It causes us to isolate, to detach, to go into hiding. And then you feel alone. When you feel alone, that's when hopelessness begins to set in. You think everything bad that's happening to you is because of what you have done. You feel like God is out there to get you. You see, the problem is this. The more guilt you carry, the more hopeless you become. But you don't have to stay that way. I love what Paul wrote in Hebrews 7.19. In your outline, read that with me. He said this, Now we have a far better hope, for Christ makes us acceptable. Notice that word. Christ makes us acceptable to God, and now we may draw near to Him. That means, that simply means, you don't have to be afraid of God once you put your trust in Christ, you don't have to run away from God when you sin. You don't have to go on hiding. You don't have to, you don't have to, to punish yourself. Instead, when we sin, when you sin, we run back to Him, right? We run. Why? Because He's waiting to forgive us, to pick us up, to get us going again. Now, when I sin as a Christian, when I blow it, God doesn't condemn me. He doesn't say, oh my goodness, you're out. You're, you're out of here. Get out of my face. He doesn't reject us. He doesn't scold us. He doesn't blow up and say, you know what? Forget it. You're, you're no longer part of my family. When we are inconsistent in our spiritual journey and we fail, he doesn't say, oh my goodness, I'm never going to forget that one. You said that last week, now you're doing it again. He doesn't hold a grudge against us. When you feel condemned, listen to me, when you feel condemned after you come to Jesus and you've confessed your sins, I can tell you that that's not from God. When you begin to feel condemned, that's not from God. You see, our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, our memories will sometimes condemn us. And here's the truth. Sometimes people will condemn us. But can I say this? God will never condemn you. Now, you know why we can have hope, right? Because He pardons, His pardon erases all our sins and our guilt. That's enough reason to have hope that I don't have to carry this guilt and this shame and this fear in my life, all the things I've done wrong. Now, here's the second reason. Not only does God take care of your past, but He takes care of your present. God, Jesus, gives us a life without dominion because His power breaks all our bad habits, right? Now, I don't have to be controlled by anything. That's basically what it is. Did you know that one of the causes of hopelessness is the feeling of being trapped under something that is beyond our, your strength to overcome? You just feel like, I can't do anything about this. Most problems are summarized into one my life is out of control. That's the first problem. I can't seem to get things together. I just, I just feel like I'm always falling apart. Just about the time I, I make ends meet, someone moves the end, and I just can't seem to get it together. Now, the other group of problem is this. I just can't seem to change. I know what's right. I even do, I want to even do what's right. I just don't have the power to do it. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt that way? I'm sure you have. We all have, right? You say, well, I know this bad habit is bad for me. I know this habit is really destroying me, but I still do it. I know this hang up is messing up my life and messing up the people around me, but I still, it, it's got a hold on me, Pastor. I can't kick it out. Some of you are saying, I know this relationship is destroying me. It's very self-destructive, but I still do it. I just can't seem to let go. I don't have the power to change. Now notice what Paul said in Romans 8 too. He said this, the power of a life-giving spirit and his power is mine through Jesus Christ has freed me from the vicious cycle of sin and death. Freed me from what? The vicious cycle of sin and death. Did you know that sin 
is a vicious cycle. What does that mean? It means you get tempted, you fall into temptation, and then you feel guilty. And then it repeats. You get tempted, you fall for it, and then you feel guilty. It's a vicious cycle. And for those of you who have hang-ups and habits that you know is destroying you, you know what that feels, right? You don't have to stay in that cycle. When you have Christ in you, He will give you the power to change. And this is what we say in Celebrate Recover. That so many people are saying, I want to change, I want to change, and they've tried and tried for years. Can I say this? Friends, only God can change your life. Only God can give you the power to overcome that sin, that habit that takes you down. The amazing thing is this, the more I yield control my control the more i yield control of my life to god the freer i become i become a master of my circumstances instead of mis the circumstances mastering me when i yield my control my control I yield control of my life to jesus christ i become more freer as i give control of my life to god he sets me free from all those things that have been controlling me all my life that means I do not have to feel hopeless of my situation. Can I say this? I have sat down with people who in tears and say, Pastor, I hate what I'm doing. I hate what I'm doing to my family. I just don't have the power. Can I say this? If there were one thing, there were one thing that you could change about yourself, is it a harmful habit, a destructive behavior, an out of control emotion? What would it be? Can I say this? There is hope, my friend. That can be changed. That's the power that Jesus Christ gives us. Now, I want you to hear me out here. This is not about being good. This is not about trying so hard. It's about saying, God, I cannot handle my situation. I can't handle all these hangups in my life. I cannot handle this destructive habit in my life. Jesus, I need your power. I like to say this. If I did not believe what I'm talking about this morning, I would not even have the courage to say this. Now notice what the Bible says, God's mighty power, read it with me. God's mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, and thoughts or hopes. God says, I will give you the power to change. Don't worry about the changes. Don't worry about forcing yourself. Trust me, I'll give you the power. There is hope. And friends, can I say this? As I work with people in all my life, I have seen people delivered by God's power. I'm not just reading this in book. I've seen this in real life. They are with me right now. They're part of our team. I see them in church. I see them every day. They are people who have been delivered by God. Here's what God says. You think of the greatest thing you'd like to have done in your life, and I can top that. Think about that for a while. That is what God offers you. And friends, can I say this? I know some of you are related to someone who's like, he's never going to change. Oh my goodness, we're all going down. How about this? How about coming to God and say, God, we cannot handle this anymore. We're actually losing hope. God, would you give us the power? Now, here's the third kind of life Jesus gives us so that we can live a life of hope, a life without desperation, right? Now, he gives us a life, a life without desperation. That means I can always be hopeful no matter what. Why? Because his purpose transforms my problem. And we talked about this last week during Easter. That means he uses everything that happens in my life in a plan for my good. Life is just a series of problems, friend. I don't know if you already figured that out. That's really all it is. It is a series of problems. One after the other. 
The truth of the matter is, you are right now in one of three situations in life. You are either just coming out of a problem, or you're in the middle of a problem, or guess what? You are headed to a new problem. You know what that's called? Life. There are problems all around us. Now, one of the most difficult problems to hold on to, uh, one of the most difficult kind of problem to hold on to or to understand are those that seem meaningless. Have you ever had one of those problems? Like, this is so meaningless. You don't see any purpose in them. You ask the question, why is this happening to me? It's just not fair. Why is it happening to my family? When you don't understand a problem, that's the most difficult kind of problem to handle. Isn't that right? It is, right? So when you see a purpose behind the problem, when you see a meaning, when you see that there could be some kind of benefit from it, guess what? That gives you a lot of hope. I remember when my kids, my boys were little, and I would take them to the doctor for their baby shots, right? And I remember holding my son, and as we sit there, and as the, as the nurse comes and begin to, to put the needle, I can see that he would cry and scream. And, he, the, and my son looks at me and saying, Mom, why are you letting them do this to me? And I know my heart breaks, and sometimes, many times, I would turn around, I would close my eyes. But in my mind, I said, I know, son, you don't understand this, but this actually is good for you. Now, the Bible says in Romans 8, God has a purpose for every single problem you and I go through. No matter how big, no matter how little, He has a, he has a purpose for every single problem. Now, one of the greatest verse that a lot of Christians like to memorize is Romans 8.28. You're going to hear this often through this series. It says there, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. That is a very important verse. First, notice, it does not say many people misunderstand this verse. It does not say that all things are good. Obviously, not everything is good in the world, right? It also doesn't say that all things are, is going to work out good, like the way I want them, right? It does not say that all things work out the way I want them to happen. We'd like to say that, but it... It doesn't say, that verse doesn't say that. Obviously, not everything in the world works out the way we'd like it to work out. It doesn't also say that all things have happy ending. That's just not true. Being a pastor, being a, a, a community leader, I have seen sad endings in life. There are some sad endings to things in life. So what does that verse say? Let's take it apart really, really quick. Notice it says that we know that all that God causes all things to work together for good. It says there's we know. That means we are not wishing. We don't imagine. We are not psyching ourselves. We don't desire. We don't guess. It says we know. What does that mean? We have absolute confidence. There's a certainty that God is going to cause all things to work together for good. Now it says, we know, what do we know? That God is going to cause all things to work together for good. Now notice it says that God causes. What does that mean? Friends, there is a grand design behind it all. There's a grand design, designer behind it your life, behind everything that is going on in your life. Your life is not a random chance. Your life is not a result of fate. It doesn't just happen. I know some parents sometimes joke around, especially in the military, oh, Pastor Phoebe, we didn't expect him to come. He was a surprise. It was an accident. I want to let you know this. First of all, parents, please don't say that. There are no accidental children. There are accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. And, and kids, can I say this? Young people, can I say this? You are not an accident. You just did not come out. You just didn't happen. There's no such thing as bad luck or good luck, right? There's a grand design behind it all. There is a cause. It doesn't say that God causes evil. It says He causes things to work together for good. Now you say, well, what about the mistakes I've done? Yes, even that. Of course we make mistakes, but get this. God 
doesn't make mistakes. What about the mistakes of my parents? What about the mistakes that happen in the world? That's true. There are a lot of mistakes in the world. But friends, can I say this? God doesn't make any mistake. Now notice it says there, we know that God works, causes all things to work together for good. All things, all things. What does all things include? Friends, everything. Does that include illness? Yes. Does that include marriage problem? Yes. Does that include a loss of job? Yes. Now notice, God causes all things, notice the next part, to work together, to work together for good. Not separately, but together. What does that mean? God takes all the events in my life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the shameful, the painful situation. God takes all that and he weaves it together. Your life is a tapestry. Have you ever seen a tapestry or a rug? The underside of a rug that's been woven together. It is very, very messy. A tangled web of yarn and, 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 and twine. It is such a mess. You don't see any beauty behind the rug. Have you ever looked behind the backside of a piece of needlepoint? I used to do that. Not anymore. On the front side, there's this beautiful cross stitch. But the backside, it's all jumbled with, with, with threads and, and lots of knots and, and cross and, and, and threads that doesn't make sense. Can I say this? God is weaving a tapestry of your life, a beautiful picture. And from heaven, looking down, he's weaving this beautiful picture of your life, looking up. All we see is the underside of that rug. We see the mess. We see the mass conglomeration of threads and yarns and knots. And, and we're thinking, oh my goodness, all this thread doesn't match. It's such a mess. You see dark threads, light threads, threads that doesn't match. They're all a mismatch jumble. And you can think, gosh, my life doesn't have any sense. It's because you're looking at it at the wrong viewpoint. God looks down and sees just what he's weaving in your life. And the truth of the matter is if you know weaving, if you know needlepoint, it takes all kinds of colors of thread to make that needlepoint come to life, to make it beautiful and attractive. I like to say this, it takes all kinds of color of thread to make your life. And it takes all kinds of experiences to make your life. It takes all the good and the bad. It takes the sorrows and the pain, the disappointment, the broken heart, the happy days and the, the stormy days. God says, I'm going to take all that and I'm going to weave it all together. Friends, can I say this? Only God can pull something like that. You ask me, Pastor Fee, what about the evil things that happen? Can God bring good out of evil? Absolutely. We just saw it last week, right? We celebrated resurrection. It was evil to nail Jesus Christ to the cross, to torture him, to stab his side, to do all that. It was evil. But that evil was turned into a resurrection. It turned into a life. It brought salvation to humanity. It brought hope. Friends, can I say this? God can bring good out of evil. And I'll say it again. Only the God of the Bible can pull something like that. You see, when I know something good can come out of the deepest pain in my life, I will never lose hope. When I am faced with things that are so painful and I'm thinking, gosh, where is this going? At least in the back of my mind, I have faith and I know I have a certainty that this God who called me to be his own is working a beautiful tapestry of my life. I have, I'll never have to lose hope. Here's the next reason why. Because God gave me a life without intimidation. His protection relieves my fear. Fear is another great cause of hopelessness. 
During the pandemic two years ago, people were stricken with fear of getting the virus, that no one wants to go to the hospital or even see physicians for fear of getting infected. The doctors, some of the, our doctor friends were telling us and our nurses like, people are not checking, going to the hospital even if they have an appointment because they're just so scared, pastor. And then they end up dying because that problem was so simple and could have been addressed, but because they didn't want to go to the hospital to be checked or to be addressed, they end up perishing, they end up dying. You see, psychologists have identified 645 different types of fear. And under each of those types, there are hundreds of others listed under them. Friends, can I say this? When you are full of fear, you cannot have hope. You cannot be full of hope. So it pulls you down and it causes you to despair. When you fear the future, you despair of hope, of, of the future. Now, what is your greatest fear in life right now? Is it the fear of dying? Is it the fear of being rejected? Is it the fear of being alone in life? Is it the fear of failure? What is your fear? Did you know that 365 times in the Bible, God says, fear not. He says, I want you to get the point. So I'll say it every day of your life, every day of your year, every day of the year, don't be afraid. Romans 8.31 says this, so what should we say about this? Paul said, if God is for us, no one can defeat us. In another translation, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody, right? Notice that phrase, for us, those two words, for us. Can I say this? If you are a Christian, God is not only with you all the time, but He is for you. I don't know how that makes you feel, but that relieves a lot of my fear from, from in my life. God is for me. He's not just with me, but He is for me. I always tell people this. There are people in your life who are with you, but they are not really for you. And that's just a fact of life. And that's okay, right? But God said, I am not only with you all the time, but I am for you. I want you to hear God say that to you. That should give you enormous hope, regardless of what you're facing right now. God is not only with you, He is for you. Now, Hebrews 6 says this, He who have found we who have found safety with him are greatly encouraged to hold on firmly to the hope placed before us. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives. Get that. We can hold on firmly to the hope placed before us. Who is that hope? Jesus Christ. We can hold on to him. Why? He is the one who feels, who makes us feel safe. I can feel safe with Jesus Christ. Now notice what he said there. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives. An anchor. You know what anchor does? Anchor keeps big ships secured from drifting. Back then in the olden days, when they had these giant sailing ships, they also had storm anchors that they carry. That even when they're out in the middle of the sea, in the middle of a storm, a raging storm, all they had to do was drop those anchors and the boat would remain steady and would not be tossed by the waves and, and not drift around. I'd like to remind of all, all of us, I need that same anchor in life, and I know you do too. We need something in our life when we're going through crisis and tragedy, the experiences that shakes us up, the storms in life, when, when, when some road wind catches us off guard, we need something to stabilize our life. We need a hope that is deep and strong and lasting. And friends, can I say this? Believers, can I say this? If you are right now being, being daunted by fear, being overwhelmed by fear, you have forgotten the God that had called you to be His child. 
You need that hope that is deep and strong and lasting. And Jesus says the anchor for our soul is when we put our hope in Him. Remember we talked about this last week. In the New Testament, hope is not just an idea. Hope is a person. And that person, my friend, is Jesus Christ. Here's the last promise that God has given us why we can live a life of hope. I need to never be worried. I need to never be hopeless. Why? Because Jesus Christ has given me a life without limitation. What does that mean? Because His provision supplies my need. I have no, He gives me a life without limitation. That means when I am in need of something, He gives me what I need. The fact is God has promised to meet every single need in your life if you will only trust Him. He did not promise to meet all our greeds, but He did promise to meet all our needs. He'll meet your emotional need, your physical need, your spiritual need, your mental needs, your relational needs, your social need, whatever you have. Now notice that verse in Romans 8.32, it says there, Since God did not spare even His own Son for us, but gave Him up for us, won't He also surely give us everything else? Though that verse is saying, if God loves me enough to send Christ to die for me, doesn't He care enough to take care of my everyday needs, all my needs? The answer is obvious, my friend. Of course He does right? Psalms 84, 11 says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God wants to bless your life. In Philippians 4, 19, he said this, God will use his wonderful riches in Christ to give you, notice, to give you what? Everything. When you get out insurance, an insurance policy, and you know what it covers. You don't worry about what it covers. God says to you and me today, here is my insurance policy. I cover everything that you need and you're going to need in life. What does that include? Everything. Does that include college tuition? Yes. Does that include doctor's bill? That's, does that include car payment? Yes. God says, does that include my, my food? Yes. Everything. And then finally, Romans 8 gives us one last reason why we should never be hopeless. Jesus gave us a life without separation. God's promise, God promises to secure our future, secure our life. Now listen to this verse in Romans 8, 38 and 39. He said, neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor, nor, nor spirits, nothing now, nothing in the future, no powers, nothing above us, nothing below us, nor anything else in the whole world will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Friends, can I say this? Nothing will make God stop loving you and me. Nothing will make God stop loving us. Once we put our life in Christ's hand and I become a part of his family, he guarantees that I will spend eternity with him. He says, I will always be with you and I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. We talked about this last week. It was such a powerful verse. Once you put your life in Christ's hand, he said, I am going to carry you through eternity. Lamentations 3.22 says this, I have hope when I feel think of this. I have hope when I think of this. The Lord's love never ends. His mercy never stops. Not only does it never end here on earth, my friend, it just keeps on going until eternity. You see, our hope doesn't even end in this world. We have been guaranteed by Jesus Christ. If first we die, 
before he comes back, we're going to go right into heaven. And today, can I say this? There are a lot of articles coming out talking about the crisis of confidence in our nation. Americans, they said, have lost hope. American people have lost hope. Study and survey after survey shows that America no longer put hope in their government. They've lost hope in their leaders, in their school system, in their future, in the justice system, in medical experts. They even lost they even lost hope in some of the religious leaders that they follow. When you look at the problem our nation is facing, it seems, it seems like, wow, things are very overwhelming. It seems like the problem is unsolvable. It seems like we are getting worse more than ever before. I think we're all doomed. Are we? Are we really? What do we do? Live in despair? live in hopelessness, spread doom and gloom everywhere we go? No, exactly no. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have given you all these things in life. Keep on living, keep planning, keep creating, and keep dreaming, keep sharing this hope to others who do not have this hope. Friends, because the God who is the source of hope is always ready to give you the hope in every circumstances you face in this life. God has already given us hope. His name is Jesus Christ. And He's been here. It's here. It's been here for 2,000 years ago. Hope is available. We just need to make a choice to live it every day. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, please do not forget the blessed hope that we have while we are here and when we are taken up to glory. And for those of you who are seekers, those of you who are still kind of dilly-dallying, I don't know if I really want to do this, can I say this? Examine the facts. Examine the teaching. Examine what Jesus has offered you. And tell me, is this something you can just walk away from? And I'd like to close with this. If you are here this morning, if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, wow, I'm on the end of my rope. I just feel like I've done it all, I've tried it all and I can't make it anymore. I'm alone. Can I say this? God brought you to this site this morning to let you know you can restore that hope wherever you are in life there is hope and my prayer this morning is in your space that God invades your space and you sense his presence I don't know how he's going to do that I don't know God is God he will meet you in your own in your own way in his own way at your point but here's what I like to say if you've never invited Jesus Christ in your life today is the day it couldn't be any clearer. Today is your day. Somehow, if you've never come and watch us, maybe you're here today, or maybe you've watched us before, but it's just kind of like you didn't really get it. But this morning, God is zeroing on you and saying, hey, I have hope for you, regardless of what your situation is. I have hope for you. Why don't you just, in your heart, pray this simple prayer. Say this, Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but I realize today what you have offered to me. Today, I accept your offer. Would you forgive me for my sins and erase my guilt? And God, I ask you to transform my problems and help me with my bad habits and relieve me from my fears. And I ask you, God, to meet my needs. And most of all, Lord, I pray that you would receive me in your kingdom, receive me in your family, so that my future is guaranteed. God, this morning, I realize it is really an offer I can never refuse. So today, Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my life, and I ask you to take lordship of my life. I want to follow you from here on out. Please help me to know you more. Help me to understand your ways. 
and help me to begin to trust you. In your name I pray. Father, I pray for all those who pray that prayer, who are opening their life to you, who are receiving the hope that only comes from you, God. I pray in your divine way, in your supernatural way, God, come into their space and let them know that something real had taken place in their life. I'd like to talk to you, to, to many of you who are believers, maybe some of you are believers. You've already prayed that prayer before. You're a believer. Now I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Say this just in your heart. Say, Dear Jesus, today I've again understood that you are my hope and you are the hope of the world and you are the hope of every area of my life. God, help me to never forget that. Help me to never take that for granted. Forgive me, Lord, for fearing, for doubting. For forgive me, Lord, for running to everything else and not running to you. And Lord, would you please help me to share this hope with others who are hopeless? Help me to give and spread the good news, God, of your hope to those in my sphere of influence. And God, beginning today, I want to dream again. I want to plan again. I want to thrive again and live because today I am choosing a life of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much again for joining us this Sunday. My prayer is this. Can I say this for those of you who are kind of like in the edge of life? And you're thinking, I don't know if I really want to do this. I don't know what I want to do this. I want to let you know this. If you have prayed that prayer, God heard you. Now, here's the next thing I'd like for you to do. Please reach out. Reach out to somebody you trust. Reach out to a spiritual leader. Reach out to an elder, someone who is close to you. Reach out to them and say, hey, I'm going through this. Would you pray for me? There is help out there. And I'd like to let you know this. I am very sure if you pray that prayer, God is going to bring someone in your path. May God bless you again. Thank you. I will see you all next Sunday. I love you all.